what I wanted to do uh, before I came here is just understand Thunder Bay. What does it mean to be from, from Northern Ontario? And I, I, over the years, I've met quite a few people from Thunder Bay itself and from Northern Ontario. And one of the things they often mentioned to me was that, well, what it means to be from the North, so to speak, is that we're not from Toronto. Right? The point of all this is to sort of think of our places as, what do we mean when we say Thunder Bay, right? What do we mean when we talk about any kind of place? Uh, and where this is sort of heading is, will Thunder Bay become the place that you associate with cycling in the way that you now associate it with uh, the Sleeping Chine, the forestry, right? I want to talk more about how, you know, Thunder Bay can benefit uh, promoting cycling to a wider population. And I want to do this sort of in two ways. First, I want to talk more about, well, what are actually sort of these broader social, economic, and to some extent environmental uh, benefits of engaging in cycling? And why should a municipality uh, be engaged in this kind of, you know, promotion and infrastructure provision? And then I want to talk a bit more about the young adult labor force, because as it turns out, um, building cycling infrastructure and sort of connecting that also with, uh, with walkable cities and with public transit is one of the things that we're hearing more and more young people are saying that's what the kind of thing they look for when they decide where to move or where to, to start a family. And so promoting this sort of cycling infrastructure becomes about much more than just about cycling or, you know, riding your bike, it becomes actually partly an economic development strategy. With cycling in particular, I want to emphasize a little bit the economic benefits. And one that often comes up, particularly in communities like yours, is tourism. You're surrounded by, you know, beautiful natural landscapes. And so providing a actual bike network um, out on the trails is as important uh, as to do so in the city because your tourists are more likely going to be riding uh, out on, in the natural areas. This is actually a really particularly uh, interesting opportunity for Thunder Bay because you have this natural landscape so close to your city that you can kind of uh, you know, capitalize on that and say, well, how do we get more people to come here and enjoy that as part of their traveling, as part of their recreation? And when they come, you know, we're more than happy to accept their dollars, right? <laughs> um, and, and they will benefit our, uh, our economy, but they'll also get a really nice, uh, nice holiday out of it, right? Um, you also have reduced traffic. In, in the case of Thunder Bay, that's a little bit of a longer term uh, objective, right, or vision, is to say, well, if you're actually successful in moving people from the automobile, either to walk to work or to bike to work, um, or perhaps public transit, you're reducing the wear and tear on your road infrastructure, which then potentially in the long run would mean less maintenance on your road, fewer costs of road maintenance and so forth, because all those other modes are not as, uh, you know, not as intensive in terms of the up, uh, upkeep that you need to do on the roads. There's the bike shops and clubs, right? So people actually selling bikes and all those kind of things that adds to your local, local economy. Also, there's larger macroeconomic costs uh, to, to the way we get around people on the health research side are pointing to growing obesity and also asthma in the, in the larger cities, particularly in the summer, where it's linked to things like smog and air pollution. And so if you're moving more people away from using the automobile, you can potentially reduce emissions, which also would mean that you're, you know, reducing your impact in terms of air pollution, but you're also getting people doing something more active. Then there's the sort of local economy, right? A number of studies uh, across North America have found that cyclists actually spend um, as much or more than drivers in the local economy, and that they make more frequent trips uh, to downtown areas. Um, and so in doing so, and when they're there, they also visit more shops. Uh, and then in doing so, they're actually contributing uh, to the local economy. This is an important uh, finding that's, you know, become up more and more because in many downtowns, uh, shop owners are sometimes concerned, well, if um, if we get rid of parking spaces, if we make it harder for people to get there by car, um, will we lose business, right? And it turns out, well, cyclists, they come and they spend money, right? And as it turns out, they spend as much or in some cases more than people who drive to your downtown areas. So they're able to do what we uh, often call trip chaining, meaning you go to one place, right, and you can hit up the grocery store, the pharmacy, uh, and maybe also, I don't know, what else we can you buy? T-shirt or something, right? Um, you can do all that in, in one trip, uh, as opposed to when your uses are very dispersed, it's harder to do that. And so downtowns and sort of an agglomeration of businesses in general that are well served by cycling infrastructure or people are able to walk, it's much easier to do that kind of trip chaining than if all your stores are kind of dispersed and you're only able to get to them by car. And then finally, and that's the point I'll talk a bit more about, is sort of this 
um, ability to attract a younger workforce by signaling that you're the kind of city that's investing in, in life, what's often called kind of lifestyle amenities, right? So how does this connect to millennials? And what is a millennial in, in the first place, right? Generally, a millennial is somebody that's born in the early 80s until sort of the 2000s, right? And it's argued that people grew up in that time were exposed to particular kinds of technological and social changes that kind of shaped the way they think. Uh, as an urban planner and uh, an urban geographer and interested in the economies of cities, I'm interested in how this generation grew up in cities and its suburbs uh, more than any, any other generation before in Canada. And so what does that mean for the way, uh, you know, the future of our cities in terms of its economy and social structure? Uh, how do we plan for that, right? And how do we accommodate that? And so if we're you know, serious about uh, developing uh, our economy to attract those millennials, uh, we have to think about those kind of amenities that, that they will be looking for. This is the kind of thing people are telling us why they want to live in downtowns, why they want to live in places where it's easy to get around on foot or by bicycle, is because they're saying, well, they want to get around without the need to drive, right? They love being where the action is. They love friendly chats with local merchants. They, bump, they love bumping into people they know, or they love the human size of downtown. Some of these things aren't actually going to be, be true in the much larger cities where cycling is very common. You know, bumping into people you know, or friendly chats with local merchants, that's going to happen much more in a community like yours, where you're more likely to know the people where, where, you're, where you're interacting on an everyday basis. So, you know, smaller and medium-sized cities are actually well positioned to kind of create those downtowns that foster that kind of activity, because it's easier to get people sort of uh, together and feeling like it's a neighborly kind of place, right? And so if you can't, you know, get these people in your city, then you're going to face some challenges because there's such a large cohort and where they live will impact things like the housing market and where employers are going to go, right? Because increasingly those employers move to where they think their employees want to live. Not completely, right? But a part of that decision is made along those lines. So what I've been calling all this, right, of the young people moving downtown, I've been calling this youthification because what's happening is that young people move in and they stay there for a shorter period of their life, for a stage in their life where they're wanting to be young adults, right? There's a sort of really technical and academic explanation that could give you what I mean by youthification, but I actually think this quote from a, a, a young Vancouver resident who was cited in this uh, Globe and Mail article a number of years ago, this actually sums up perfectly what I mean by youthification, right? And it's about a place where their friends are there, their girlfriend is there, their work is there. For this period in my life, it just seems that everything I want is right downtown. You know, that's sort of a situation we're observing more common, and it shapes, of course, where these young people are willing to live. And in large part, this has meant large cities um, with very well-developed active transportation systems, lifestyle amenities, right, entertainment. Uh, but, you know, these are the kind of places that we're recently at least suggesting they're having economic growth. They're providing the kind of cultural and, uh, and, and lifestyle amenities uh, that are attracting the young adults. Um, this is Vancouver. The darker the red, it means that's where young adults are most concentrated. The white circle sort of draws a 10-kilometer um, a radius around the downtown. So this is the downtown in Vancouver. At the lighter the yellow, that's where more older generations live. And what you can see in Vancouver, for instance, is a really strong central centralization um, of that in and around the downtown, the higher density areas. Then it goes along the sky train. This is their you know, public transit system. And so even the young adults who aren't living downtown, they're living along transit lines. They're living in sort of secondary downtowns that exist in the suburbs of Vancouver where they can walk and or cycle. So their revealed preferences, so to speak, as econo economists like to say, suggest they like living in places that have all this active transportation. Detroit, also here, you know, this is not where your young adults are concentrated in the center. They're a little bit more suburban. But even here, the whole geography is spread out a little bit more, and there's not really the high... Uh, concentration of movement in Detroit, as you can imagine, right, given the economic decline that the city has, has experienced. And this story over here, you know, is one of, of economic decline due to the, you know, the, the decline in manufacturing that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and it has to do, of course, a lot with declining job opportunities. And so you're not either retaining your own young people, and you're also, of course, not attracting people from the outside, because they're just not the jobs for people, right? And, and to some extent, Thunder Bay is in that category. And I'm suggesting, you know, of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, investing in cycling in and of itself isn't going to move you necessarily up here, 
but it's necessary even if not uh, sufficient completely. Uh, some of my research has particularly looked at the young adult incomes and their employment opportunities. And what I found in that research is that young people for doing the same kinds of jobs that somebody did 20, 30 years ago are earning less money for those same jobs, even though if they have the same qualifications. Uh, and well, so what that means is that the economy has changed in a way where the same kinds of jobs are not being rewarded with the same kinds of income. Um, and so they have lower spending powers and they also actually have lower expected earnings then over their lifetime. And so what that means is that affordability is actually becoming a more important component in shaping these location decisions. And many have argued it's also partly the explanation why so many of the younger people want to get around without a car, because it's cheaper for them to be able to walk and bike than to buy a car um, and to you know, pay for the insurance and all those things. And this is sort of the question then, so will these young adults stay in the center of the city? And this is an important question for the large cities, because in the large cities, they're hoping that the young will stay downtown and continue to be heavy users of the transit system, then maybe consider raising their children there. But it turns out the largest cities are having trouble retaining those young adults, because even if we accept that people are okay raising children in a smaller space, right? don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting you need to have this huge mansion to raise a kid, but to have the extra bedroom is certainly something that uh, that people are seeming to be looking for and so what that means is that as people are deciding to have children they're not going to be staying in those places and so you know what I'm suggesting is that uh, if the young people are not staying in the large cities for those reasons as they decide to start a family that's one of the points in time where you can kind of say oh okay this is the point in time where Thunder Bay and other medium and small size cities can benefit from trying to attract young adults because your housing is much cheaper and you're gonna get a bit more space here than if you bought you know a house or well, obviously a, a small apartment condominium in Toronto so you can kind of benefit from the fact that you know these larger cities have become so expensive and so you know normally when I give this presentation in larger cities they always hope that the answer is yes but when I'm giving it here in Thunder Bay and in other me medium CSI cities we really hope the answer is no because if they don't stay in the large cities they may move to, to, to other kinds of uh, kinds of communities um, and really you know it's it's about these points right that are, I think are really going to be critical as to whether large cities can retain the Millennials and the young adults is can they keep those places afford affordable, but in the meantime, right, it's, it's these other places that have affordable, more affordable housing that can really, that can serve as a, as a magnet to bring people in. You know, there's a couple of key studies that, that, that looked at what kind of environments people move back to when they're deciding sort of, not when they go to school and all that, right, it's sort of after that, when they decide, well, where do I want to live longer term? And one of the things that they found is that people really are drawn to the kinds of uh, residential environments as this, uh, that are similar to where they grew up. So what that means is that somebody Somebody's grown up in a rural area, they're more likely to move back to any rural area. And that's a really, I think, uh, an opportunity for a place like Thunder Bay because it means you don't have to restrict yourself to say, well, okay, some of our young people, they've left, they've gone to school somewhere else, let's get them back. You can kind of say, well, let's try to attract all the broader population of young people that's left kind of any smaller community uh, across the country because we may be an attractive place uh, to them because it feels more like home, right? It also means the reverse though, right? So people who were born and raised and grew up in downtown Toronto, you're less likely going to be attracting those, those to Thunder Bay. And I wouldn't say that's a bad thing, right? You just need to know where to focus your energy, right? You need to know um, who are you going to work towards attracting in terms of your economic development strategy. Locations are becoming less permanent. So one of the recommendations I often make on that front is that you know, if you invest in your rental market, it's easier for people to move to your community for a few years to pursue a job and then they can more easily move away again if the job comes up elsewhere because that's become sort of the nature of the economy is that people move around more and, jo and switch jobs more. I don't think there's really disagreement in the literature that generally we're seeing urban amenities and active transportation that are more important to younger generations. I, I say there's not really any disagreement because there's some disagreement because there's certainly a point to be made that there's still a large number of younger people living in, in suburbs that are automobile dependent, living in smaller and medium sized communities uh, where they're relying on the automobile. Um, and so we have to sort of be careful whether we're saying, well, they already live in places that have active transportation, or do we look at the more attitudinal and survey research that says, well, where would you like to live if you could? And you know, there's some, some of those surveys show, well, a lot of young people would like to live in places with active transportation, but they don't because they can't afford the housing near those places. And again, right, 
Good thing for Thunder Bay, as you add active transportation, you're more likely to become a place that is affordable and that has that active transportation component, whereas none of the big cities can say we're affordable and we have active transportation. Right? That's really not a realistic proposition. Again, you know that point re-emphasizing re that jobs matter. Right? I'm not here going to suggest that build the cycling lanes and suddenly you're going to have um, you know, thousands of new jobs. Right? It's important to be realistic about that. But it's, it's certainly necessary, given how um, young people are deciding to locate today, and given how people are wanting to live their life, um, you know, focused around a lifestyle amenities and recreation, that if you don't invest in those things in your city, you're going to have a harder time attracting young adults. Um, it's not necessary or, or even necessarily a good thing for places like Thunder Bay to try and compete with those larger cities to provide you know, a downtown that will in some odd way um, resemble that of, of, of a larger city. Because realistically, at first, you're never going to get there. But also, that's not what people are looking for when they think about Thunder Bay. right? So the solution has to really come, I would argue, from the community and from Thunder Bay in conjunction with your municipal leaders and your, your amazing, you know, dedicated, enthusiastic staff. I think that's a really good starting point for, for making things happen. But the solution really has to be from Thunder Bay for Thunder Bay. And hopefully I've provided you with some ideas um, here today and that uh, you, know, you can sort of take away and then make your own in ways that are, uh, that are suitable for your community. The, the thing I want to end with is that sometimes we think of active transportation like walking and cycling, um, not sort of cycling for recreational purposes, right, but, which is great, but the, the cycling where we want people to get on their bikes to ride to work right, or to get their groceries, we tend to think of that sometimes as either a, a larger city phenomenon or, or something that only happens in Europe. right? But one place to actually, I think, look to is some of those smaller and medium-sized European cities because in that context, you'll have high cycling rates, but their cities are about some of the size similar to yours, right? Whereas if you use Toronto and Ottawa and Vancouver as examples, you're looking at communities that are very different from yours in terms of its urban structure, its economy, and so forth. Um, European cities are going to be very different from yours, but in terms of the size of the community and the way they're able to, def to create sort of defined town centers that are easily accessible by bike or on foot, that's a lesson that I think you can take away from that. Um, and remember, you know, you don't have to become like Toronto to become a bike city. Not that you ever perhaps wanted to anyways. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>